Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Something to Marvel at, Urban Life in America, 1865 to 1920, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources program and America in Class from the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm, the Vice President for Education Programs at the Humanities Center, and I will be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, I'd like to introduce you to the sponsors of the seminar. The Teaching with Primary Resources program is a program of the Library of Congress that provides professional development for teachers and others in the use of primary documents. The program seeks to introduce you to the many collections that the Library of Congress offers through all sorts of different professional development opportunities. To find out about opportunities in your area, you can go to uh, the URL you see at the bottom of your page there. The Waynesburg University is responsible for coordinating these programs on the East Coast. Or you can simply type into a browser, Teaching with Primary Resources, and you'll find all sorts of programs available to you. The National Humanities Center, the other sponsor, is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Let me explain what that means. We're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, so that means the main program we offer here is a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center to research and write books and articles in subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978, and since then we've had about 1,300 scholars pass through our doors, and they've produced about 1,300 books. That makes the place sound perhaps like an ivory tower, and it sort of looks like an ivory tower, but it really isn't one. The founders wanted it to connect with a whole variety of different audiences, and they were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a variety of ways. If you want to find out how we do that, type into your browser americainclass.org, that will take you to this page, and on this page, you will have access to all of the resources that we offer uh, teachers. I think you'll find a rich array of very useful things in americainclass.org. Now, I want to tell you about uh, this evening's seminar. Uh, when it's all over, if you want to relive the wonderful experience, you can go to the uh, uh, web page uh, from which you obtain your readings, and there you will find a recording of the seminar and a recording of the PowerPoint. Please feel free to plunder the PowerPoint, use it in your classes, that's what it's there for. On this site, you will also find an evaluation. You can complete it online and submit it to us online. Please do that, it's very important. Uh, we pay attention to what you say on those evaluations, and uh, we take them to heart and make changes accordingly. Once we receive your evaluation, you will get back from us a letter that you'll be able to present to your local certifying authority to receive whatever sort of uh, recertification credit this seminar uh, warrants. Now, I would like to point out something to you, ladies and gentlemen. In this seminar this evening, we're going to be talking about how to use primary documents in uh, your teaching. To help you do that, I would like to draw your attention to what we call the National Humanities Center's primary document application form. A wonderfully bureaucratic term, we've got to come up with a better name for it, but it is designed for teachers as a lesson planning aid, and it will help you integrate primary resources into your classes. It will help you frame understandings, identify key passages. I think the most important thing it offers, though, is a way to develop systematically discussion questions that promote close analysis. To get access to the primary document, primary document application form, go back to the uh, Something to Marvel at website, and you see the area that I bracketed there on the website. I blew that up at the bottom of the page. There you will find a link to the primary document application form. Please take a look at that. I think you'll find it very helpful in planning your classes and bringing primary documents into them. Now, let me say a word about how this evening's seminar will proceed. Our scholar will make remarks key to the presentation of slides that will offer excerpts and images. We will ask you to, uh, through discussion, to analyze them. I hope we'll have a lot of chat and uh, really get into these discussions. The way you can uh, participate in the seminar, put your cursor in the uh, box that I have bracketed in green at the bottom of the screen, type your message, and to the right you see a send button. Hit that send button and your message will appear on the box above the send box. So let's get underway, ladies and gentlemen, by stating at the outset here our goals for this evening. First of all, we seek to deepen understanding of the urban experience in late 19th and early 20th century America. 
We also hope to provide fresh primary, primary resources for use with your students, and these resources will be drawn from collections that you'll find online put up by the Library of Congress and the National Humanities Center. And we also offer, uh, hope to offer you some discussion strategies that you'll be able to use in your classes to promote close textual analysis. Now, we have an understanding here this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is sort of the intellectual takeaway that we'd like you, uh, uh, if, if you feel so inclined, to bring back to your students. Between 1865 and 1920, the new scale and capability of technologies in the workplace, in transportation, and in everyday living transformed cities, producing both excitement and suffering, and ultimately calling forth new ideas about planning and government. So that's the idea that our, our seminar will be working toward this evening. Along the way, we hope to address the issues and questions you raised in the forum. Uh, many of you talked about the challenges of teaching this period. The major challenges I face, one teacher wrote, when teaching about urban life is the inability of the students to understand the struggles of urban dwellers. You all seem to want to cover the whole range of topics, the whole range of issues during this period. Poverty, sanitation, the plight of poor children, race, living conditions, class, gender. We're going to try to get to as many of those as we possibly can this evening. Another teacher wrote, I would love to see some images of cities before, during, and after this period to get the kids to compare them. We'll be able to address part of that this evening. This period is difficult for students to understand because there was so much going on. Urbanization, industrialization, reform, immigration, labor strife, the rise of the corporation, are there themes that can bring order to these various topics? Well, we'll try to provide some of those themes this evening. We had a range of questions. How did this period create a better life in America for people of many races and classes? How did immigration affect the development of cities, including infrastructure during this period? How did class manifest itself in cities? Did urban gang violence in the US begin during this period? How did American cities differ from European cities? How dirty were American cities? And did the upper and lower class folks mix and mingle in our cities? Well, ladies and gentlemen, to help us get through all of these issues this evening, we are very pleased to have with us Henry Binford, professor of history at Northwestern University and a National Humanities Center fellow back in 1990 and 91. Henry's written widely about um, urban issues in the 19th century. We put up one of the titles of his publications. So now let me turn the program over to Henry and we'll just locate his name here. Uh, and we'll turn the program. There it is right there. Okay, Henry, you are now the presenter. So tell us about urban life in America from 1865 to 1920. It's all yours, Henry. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm glad to be hosting uh, this online seminar this evening, and uh, I am grateful for the opportunity uh, to share with others some of the rich resources from uh, the Humanities Center and to the Library of Congress. I have benefited from those myself in my own classes, and I'm looking forward to a conversation uh, about them uh, this evening. You all have raised, you, uh, you contributors to the forum, have raised a great many really interesting questions about uh, cities in this period, and a number of you noted the difficulty of getting students to swallow all the many different kinds of things that were going on. Uh, I have that difficulty too when I teach my, my college students here at Northwestern and uh, I try to break it down in a number of different ways which I will have a chance to talk about some uh, this evening. Um, we're after what's new about cities in the period from the Civil War roughly down to the 1920s. Uh, but I thought what we should do is start off with some information about what was not new at the end of the Civil War about urban development. All of the things that you see on the screen before you were um, prominent characteristics of cities in the United States as well as in Europe and in England uh, before 1865. Many of them were very crowded. Uh, a lot of them had been uh, already changed by the introduction of factory work, although we're going to see some big changes in that front uh, after 1865. A lot of the things that uh, we associate with urban living, poverty, dirt, crime, gangs, they're all there before 1865, as well as the idea that cities are places uh, that are magnetic, that uh, attract people in part because they're exciting, especially to young people. This is the bright lights, big city kind of idea. 
Um, and uh, also because they offer uh, jobs, they offer a lot of things that you just can't find in the country. Uh, this is a period, especially the one we're entering here this evening, when the contrast between city and country became even more stark, and when some of the stereotypes about both cities and uh, the country, popular stereotypes, uh, came into prominent play. That countryside, uh, country living is dull, that it's dark at night and they roll up the sidewalks and so forth and so on, whereas the city it runs for 24 hours and offers a lot of excitement. And we should point out, most people at this time live in, in rural areas, in small Absolutely. towns. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And in fact, okay. it, it's not until the 1920 census, at the end of the period we're dealing with today, uh, when the census takers counted a majority of the people in the United States living in urban places. And their threshold for what was urban was pretty low. Uh, the standard they used was any place of more than 2,500 people. That's kind of a one-stop light town. So their notion of urbanity was not very challenging. Uh, and still, it's not until 1920 when more than half the population lives in those places. Throughout the period we're talking about this evening, the United States is primarily an agrarian nation. Uh, farmers pick up a large proportion of the workforce. People in the country. We've had some <clears throat> audio. audio. The last thing I wanted to mention here about what's not new is this idea that the cities are places where progress occurs, where opportunity is available, where there's greater freedom uh, for individuals, and also a lot more danger um, than there is in the country. So all of these things are, are already on the table as we start our exploration um, this evening. So the first thing we have to ask um, is what were cities like at the beginning and how did they change? And uh, we're offering here as a start in that, in that process this bird's eye view of Chicago in the 1850s. And I'm going to ask you all uh, to offer some observations about what you see here. This is a picture I, uh, versions of which I use with my students. And the first thing I always ask them is, what do you see? So those of you uh, out there in the, in the seminar, I see we have 46 people. Um, what do you see? OK, ladies and gentlemen, tell us, how, how do you see? Lots of buildings, homes, yeah, yeah. And most of them do seem like domestic dwellings. It's centered on water. Yep, water really surrounds it. It's more crowded at the waterways. Yeah, good point, good point. Important waterways, crowds coming and going, lots of buildings. Nothing too tall. That's right, Henry. This is a low-lying city at any rate. Not, not much of a modern view of the city. Students wouldn't recognize it as one. Shipping, uh, not much in the distance, although we do see the suburbs beginning to move west and north. Lots of empty lands, countryside visible. Yeah, that's going to be swallowed up pretty soon. Factories in the background. Yeah, I guess we can see some smokestacks. Few or no smokestacks. Good point. We'll be coming back to that. I think I think we have a pretty good a pretty good sense of this city. We also see uh, an emphasis on infrastructure. You've got that railroad breakwater, Michigan Avenue, bridges, any of the bridges. Okay, still in existence. No green space, space <clears throat> or playgrounds yet, or ball fields. That's an interesting point to come back to. Okay, oh, Henry. So uh, how do we stack up against your students? Oh, you get an A, all of you. There, there's uh, enough material in what you just said to work on for the whole evening. But of course, we can't, haven't got time for that. Let me just emphasize a couple of things that, that you mentioned. One is that um, this is a city, like many cities, which grew up, uh, uh, in the United States, that is, many cities which grew up oriented toward the water. Uh, Waterborne commerce was the lifeblood of cities until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and what you've got here is Chicago as a port uh, and an emphasis on a lot of facilities for um, getting goods in and out of the city. Um, it's also a city in Chicago in this period, which is uh, fairly young. It has uh, already, at this point, approaching 100,000 people. Um, and it's beginning to sprawl out uh, in, in various directions from the center. But still, by our standards, a pretty small place. Those of you who have been to Chicago, um, may recognize this area right here. Uh, it's what we nowadays call the loop, the area, the downtown. Um, and it's a low rise area. There's still a lot of uh, fairly empty space in the loop. 
uh, no skyscrapers, all that stuff just coming down the road. This is the, the kind of city that most people were accustomed to uh, at the beginning of our period here. And um, it has uh, uh, some, some features in it that are beginning to make a difference. So here's Chicago again. This time a view closer to ground level. This is looking northward along Lake Michigan. Um, so once again, let's get a few comments about what you see. Okay, we've gone from the bird's eye view to a ground view. We note the railway. Um, I think this uh, industry, pollution, yeah, there we go. Uh, recreation, uh, well, we'll come back to human scale, fishing, linked to the country by railroad. Yeah, the railroad is now important. Fishing, great. A tent, well, uh, Henry, you're going to have to comment on what that building is in the background and evidence of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, and this Absolutely. is a, this is a picture to me of transition. You seem to have uh, old ways of doing things there contrasted with the new way symbolized by the train. There we go. Great minds think alike. Transition from waterborne transport to railroad-based boat transportation business. Hey, Henry, how did we do on this one? I still get A's here. Got a, got a 4.0 average here for this group this evening. Uh, the tent that someone mentioned, this structure right here, is actually the railroad terminal for the Illinois Central Railroad, which is running on this viaduct out in the water here. Um, this is the terminus of that railroad in Chicago. The railroad ran south. Uh, it still runs south today, although it's no longer the Illinois Central. It goes all the way to New Orleans. Um, you have here Lake Michigan coming right up to the shore. The shore, as someone mentioned, is kind of messy. We got a bunch of people uh, trying to do a little fishing. Uh, lots of smoke in this picture, right along the mouth of the river, which is behind the railroad station here. There are factories, there are grain elevators. Cyrus McCormick, who located his agricultural equipment business in Chicago, in 1848, had a factory right back here. Uh, that's probably his smokestack in the in the left-hand side. Uh, Cyrus McCormick's Reaper Works was the basis for International Harvester in later years. So, okay, um, beginning to see some changes here. This is 1869. Uh, the power of the Industrial Revolution is already being felt, but a lot of those things you mentioned before are still not here. So let's move along but here. Before we, before we move on, let me just ask a question. We had um, a participant noted that the people in the boats were doing recreational uh, fishing. Are, are those, uh, is that the case? Would they be, would they be, was that their business? I mean, there's a, a barrel there. The guy looks like he's packaging up something. Are these recreational? Uh, I'm asking to speculate. Are these recreational people or would this be a, a livelihood? It's more than likely um, a, a livelihood, although it could be a little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, many people, and I'm not sure if they're commercial fishermen, but many people in the city at this point uh, got part of their sustenance from the water. You know, there's, uh, and, and, and of course that's still true with poor people. Uh, they get the dinner from the lake when they can and save a little money on groceries. Uh, but of course, it's speculation. This is a, a painting of Chicago, and we have no idea what the artist had in mind, had in mind um, when he made this. But okay. that's a likely kind of a, a possibility. Okay, good. Biggest city in the country, New York, in uh, 1885. Just a little bit later, um, this is the beginning of a lot of change. Not to mention the biggest city in the country. Let's just contrast this with what you just saw. Okay, let's compare New York and Chicago. Um, we have a question, we'll come back to when this is moving toward including recreational spaces in the cities, we'll come back to that. Excellent. But here we have crowded, commercial, more developed, much more crowded, okay, much more shipping activity, and now we see steamships, which I don't think we saw before, a larger bridge, that's right, but only one of them. That's the Brooklyn Bridge. Taller buildings. Yeah, that's a good point. Some green space in the foreground. Undoubtedly, that's <laughs> long gone. Yeah. Actually, okay. it's not. That's Battery it's Park. Oh, that's, that's right. That's it's right. A few trees. Yeah. Okay. Skyscraper. Central Park is still. Well, you can still you can see Central Park. It's that way up right here. It's Central yeah. Park. Yeah. Five points. Gangs in New York. Lots of activity. Yeah. Okay. I think I think we're ah. There we go. Highest point is a church steeple. Right long here. Eclipsed in New York. Larger ships. Trains. Good question. Where are the trains at this point, Henry? So let's let's. Uh, how did we do on this one? There is good one. Trinity good Church. Good, good job here as well. Okay. Okay. Well, I think sharp eye enough to notice Central Park there in the way distance. Um, the um, 
this is part of an answer to the question that came up earlier about recreational areas. Uh, New York Central Park was one of the earliest such, uh, planned by Olmsted in the middle of the 1850s, uh, building all through a good part of the late 19th century, uh, a major recreation area. Now, from this view, from the tip of Manhattan, it's way off in the distance, so you can't get a proper appreciation of how big it is. But uh, Central Park was a, was a revolutionary kind of development. The idea of committing that much valuable property in the middle of the city um, to recreational places to allow everybody in the city to have fresh air and access to nature and so forth. Um, so whoever asked that question was right on. One of the things that's beginning to happen here is the concern that cities are polluted, that the air is dirty and unhealthy, uh, that people need to be able to have contact with trees and flowers, and it's harder and harder to see them uh, in the city. So you make a little bit of nature within the city. Um, and that is a trend that influences many, many cities, of course, in the rest of the century. It's something, it's a theme for the whole period uh, we're talking about now. The Brooklyn we Bridge. We, oh, excuse me, we have a question about seeing a lighthouse, and I think, I, I myself don't notice it, but <clears throat> The participant could very easily be seeing a lighthouse because there are lighthouses on the East River. I don't know about the Hudson, but yep. I do know there are lighthouses on the East. Don't know what, what in particular they're looking at. But, but okay, and here we have another question. Day. What's the beach and domed building on the southern tip? Any idea there? Uh, uh, we're, oh, uh, right down here, is that what we're talking about? Um, uh, yeah, on the left, left foreground. Yeah, that's it, right there. I, frankly, I'm not quite sure what that is. That's the site of the old fort. Uh, um, where that the Dutch established way back in uh, the 17th century, but I'm not sure what that structure is there. Okay, and we uh, someone asked if it was a precursor to Ellis Island. I don't think we have Ellis Island in this picture. Ellis Island, I think, would be probably farther off. Yes, it's not it's out, out, of, out of the picture here. Yeah, and then another question: Is the Jersey side of the Hudson meant to look underdeveloped, or is that an illusion of the picture itself? I think <laughs> that may be just the way the artist wanted to do it. I think he wanted to focus on Manhattan and yeah. not, not many, worry about New Jersey. Many of you are probably familiar with the famous New Yorker magazine cover, which uh, portrays a New Yorker's view of the United States in which Manhattan Island is lovingly detailed and everything across the Hudson River is a kind of a wasteland. Um, and this is another version of that kind of <laughs> view. Uh, yeah. Jersey was, in fact, developed uh, considerably in an industrial sense, although then and now there's a lot of marshland out here in the, um, in the, in the, in the section of New Jersey west of New York, uh, but farther away from the river. Right. I think maybe we should, we should move along. Okay, let's move along. Our, our job tonight is, although it's a lot of fun, not only to see where cities were at the beginning, but to watch for what's going to be happening later. And as a hint to what's going to happening, be happening later, um, what you've got here is, is a, uh, a list of uh, the uh, most of the largest cities in the world at these three dates, um, 1850, 1900, and 1925, with a given the population in thousands. So what you have here is New York, for example, growing from 682,000 to more than 7 million, approaching 8 million by 1925. Um, eclipsing for the first time London, which up until this point had long been the biggest city in the Western world. Um, if I were in, more interested in including a global list, there would be other Asian cities besides Tokyo on this list, but that's the primary one to be thinking about here. What you also see is what were regarded as near miraculous occurrences in the late 19th century. Chicago in 1850 had 30,000 people. And I mentioned by the time of that uh, little later image, it was pushing 100,000. And by 1900, it's well over a million and a half, uh, working toward the three and a half million that it's going to have by 1925. This was astonishing to people alive at the time. No city had ever grown that big that fast. Um, and the, you have a lot of other uh, uh, examples of rapid growth and also some that were sinking down uh, the right, the rank. Uh, we have a question here, Henry, about southern cities. Did southern cities like Atlanta and Charleston experience the same explosive growth between 1850 and 1925? Uh, Atlanta experienced considerable growth, although all southern cities, with the exception of New Orleans, uh, were considerably smaller than the ones in uh, the northeast. 
the, Atlanta is Sedona and Birmingham are the two major growth centers in the south in this period. Uh, both of them have wonderful stories to tell, but they're not in the same size ranking. And I wanted to show here the way in which American cities, the biggest ones, are shouldering their way into the very top ranks of cities worldwide in this period. Within the United States, there would be a lot to say about uh, Atlanta and Charleston. But again, they're not nearly as big as these other places. Okay. okay, and there's a question here I think we're going to get to in a moment. <clears throat> Is Chicago's growth primarily immigrants? And I think we can answer that with, with regard to all the other cities as we move ahead. So let's, yes. let's move on. Oh, we okay. have another question. Do you attribute the growth of Chicago to the meatpacking industry and immigrants moving into the area to take jobs in slaughterhouses? Okay, I think, I think we'll get to the immigrant part, but how large, later on, but how large is the meatpacking industry at this time? It's big. Uh, it's not okay. by no means the uh, the only driver of Chicago's growth. Chicago is in the same period becoming a major center of steel making and a lot of subsidiary kinds of uh, industries. Uh, Meatpacking really got launched uh, with the opening of the Union Stockyards in 1865, uh, but it's in the 70s and 80s that it it uh, begins to become a real become a real magnet for immigrants. So the question is appropriate. Uh, but it's one among many things driving the growth of Chicago. Okay. And it is true that in Chicago, as well as a lot of other northern and eastern cities, a lot of the growth that you see in these figures is from migration. It's from uh, a, a huge surge in immigration from abroad, uh, as well as migration from the country to the city of the Theodore Dreiser kind of uh, that that's, that made, was made popular uh, in Sister Carrie, his most um, famous novel. So okay, shall we move ahead then? All righty. Um, I mentioned it when we talked about, I gave you that list of things that, that were already there. One of the things that was already there um, was an extensive literature of what we would call an expose variety about cities. This is the title page from a book about New York that was published in 1868. And it has these two images. Um, you probably can't see details very clearly here, but I'll ask you just in general what you see in this picture. I want to ask that question, as you probably gathered over and over tonight. What do you see in this picture? Okay, what do we see, folks? <clears throat> see, the book has uh, lots of short scenes, makes a great class excerpt. Beginning of the Gilded Age, beautiful on the surface, not so nice underneath. The good and bad of New York, wealth in the top picture, class divisions. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, a lot of good stuff here. Uh -huh. Let me just point out a couple things here. One is the overall contrast between light and darkness, which is a favorite theme of people writing about the city uh, in this period. It reflects in part uh, real conditions in the city in which uh, the poor areas are much denser, darker, more polluted than the areas of well-to-do folks. Um, but it's also a, a, a metaphor. It has to do with the idea of health versus ill health, uh, the idea of um, Good behavior versus bad behavior, uh, the, a lot of a good versus evil, uh, and it's often captured in these kind of graphic uh, images, which are are contrasting down to the lowliest detail. The top image here is of a mansion on Fifth Avenue. All the people on the sidewalk here are well dressed and uh, respectable and uh, greeting each other properly on the street, and you have carriages with horses and so forth. Uh, the bottom images of the five points, uh, New York's most notorious area, arguably the most notorious slum neighborhood in the United States. Um, and down here, look at the poor horse here being whipped by the driver. Contrast that with this well-fed, uh, well-cared-for horse in the top picture. You've got people in all areas who are slumped over, poorly dressed. Uh, there's lots of contrast here in all sorts of ways. And that was a favorite topic of discussion already there when we're starting and continuing all the way through. And that brings us to uh, one of the most successful writers of this period, uh, Horatio Alger. Uh, I, I have a little excerpt here from Ragged Dick, which was his very first novel, the first of almost 110 novels that Horatio Alger wrote all through the latter part of the 19th century, most of them very popular a lot of them very influential. Um, Horatio Alger is providing a, a window into the city, especially into New York. And 
I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of people who read the Horatio Alger novels had never been to New York and would never get there. This is their way of, of, of vicariously experiencing life in the big city. So, Richard, I'm going to pick on you. Um, can you read this passage for us? I sure can, but we had we had a, a, num a couple of participants raise the question of social Darwinism in connection with the previous slide. Could you just comment on that? Is this the period when social Darwinism is beginning to become a powerful ideology in the country? Uh, indeed. Um, social Darwinism is n n not one of those things that's there in 1865, uh, although Darwin is uh, beginning to become influential, Darwin himself. The whole idea of social Darwinism uh, was primarily popularized in the United States by William Graham Sumner, who was a professor at Yale University and a, a very um, lucid writer who conveyed the idea that um, human beings, like plants and animals, are subject to the laws of evolution, as is human society, and that the, uh, the success cases we see in society, the, the successful people, um, are successful because they are fitter, because they are superior in some way, uh, and by contrast, those who are not successful deserve where they are. Uh, this, of course, was very controversial. Uh, it became one of the primary targets for reform, which we're going to talk about down the road here this evening. Uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. This is a period in which uh, the conditions of the city are one of the things that are prompting discussions of a social, social Darwinism sort and also the responses to it. Okay, so that image then would be a pretty um, graphic description of, to some extent, it, it echoes social Darwinism. Uh, well, yeah, although it's, it's, that was okay. published before social Darwinism right. became popular. Okay. okay, so let's get on to Ragged Dick here, and I'll do my best uh, Horatio Alger imitation. When Dick had got through with his last customer, the city hall clock indicated 8 o'clock. He had been up an hour and hard at work, and naturally began to think of breakfast. He went up to the head of Spruce Street, and turned into Nassau, two blocks further, and he reached Ann Street. On this street was a small, cheap restaurant where for five cents Dick could get a cup of coffee, and for ten cents more, a plate of beefsteak with a plate of bread thrown in. These Dick ordered and sat down at a table. It was a small apartment with a few plain tables. Okay, so we've got some people who are already responding to our uh, discussion questions here written on the uh, screen. Um, we have a question, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but uh, we have uh, Dick is a worker. He's able to buy a cup of coffee. Uh, he's thrifty, boot black, uh, living on the street. He's a creature of habit. He's a hard worker. Uh, we have a question here about the restaurant. Okay, Henry, you want to help us unpack this? What are we looking for here? We're going to use this with our students. What would we want them to see in Ragged Dick and in this particular excerpt? Well, it, the, the most obvious thing is something that our participants have already pointed out, which is that Dick is a hard worker. Um, Alger, from the very beginning of this novel, uh, conveys certain characteristics about Dick's character, which for him are the keys to what's going to happen to him later, and of course are to be emulated by other people uh, in the other boys, especially in the United States. The very first thing we learn about Dick, not in this passage, but back on the first page of the book, is that he is honest. He gets accused of maybe stealing, and he says, I wouldn't do that. In this page, of course, we indicate that we get that we he works before breakfast, before he takes a break. Um, and uh, a little further on in this passage, this same section, uh, he's going to have uh, an encounter with another boy who is less successful. Several people pointed out uh, things about New York here, and one I saw a little mention in the chat about the clock. Um, one of the things that Alger did was to emphasize um, real things, real features about New York, about the place where he's writing. This is a very early example of what's later going to be called realistic fiction. Uh, here we've got the clock, which was, in fact, of course, there. We've got specific streets that are named. A New Yorker would know that uh, what the, the route that Dick is taking uh, is a real a way to go in New York. And uh, so we're getting a, a fictional character located in um, a real scene. And that's another big tactic of Alger. And one of the keys to his popularity, people liked learning about New York, uh, especially if they couldn't afford to go there. And um, the, 
all of you probably know what's going to happen to Dick later on. Uh, he's going to, because he is hardworking, because he is honest, uh, because he is smart, street smart, in fact, uh, because he is intelligent, uh, and because he's not afraid to seize opportunity, he's going to find success. People call this a rags to riches story, but it's not really rags to riches. Uh, very few of, of Alger's characters get truly rich, at least not in the pages of the book. What they're really after is respectability. And what Alger is doing is conveying the idea of the big city as a place that is challenging and sometimes dangerous, but also a place where you can have opportunity, even if you're poor, where you can climb the ladder. Um, we talked about social Darwinism a moment ago. Um, Dick would have been, Ragged Dick would have been a hero for William Graham Sumner because he exemplifies what Sumner thought ought to be happening uh, in, in the cities of the United States. <clears throat> so we have a participant here who wrote, so Dick represents the early beginnings of Ab's great American dream ideal of prosperity and individualism. Would you say that's, that's uh, an expression of it here, and maybe move from the Jeffersonian rural ideal now to a, a kind of urban version. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's the very beginnings, because this idea has been there uh, for quite a while before right. Rachel Alder started writing. But it is um, the elaboration of that idea in a what was for a lot of people at the time a, a new city, a really big city uh, that for many people was already by the 1860s uh, changed dramatically from things that they remembered uh, in a previous generation and in some ways uh, was seen as very daunting as uh, something that was, was difficult for people. What Alger is saying is that, uh, at least from his point of view, and he kept on saying this over and over, um, if you have the right qualities of character, if you work hard, uh, if you behave yourself, luck will come to you. Blessings will come to you. And you too can be a success. Um, shall we move on? Me, just one final question: What do we make of that plate of, plate of beefsteak? Is that <laughs> that's, an, that's a detail that jumped out of me? Maybe it's because I'm hungry. But what will we make of that? Um, well, that's that's a really interesting kind of tidbit because we think of steak as something that's uh, uh, to be eaten by prosperous people. Uh, but in fact, one of the things that that signifies is that in the United States, by contrast with England and Europe. People in this period ate an awful lot of beef. Um, the United States being merely an agrarian nation uh, and increasingly being knit together by railroads was able to supply all through the early part of the 19th century large quantities of beef uh, at relatively cheap prices to people in the city. So uh, Dick has a much better diet than a bootleg of his social standing would likely have in London even though uh, Englishmen think of themselves as beef eaters, we were way ahead of them on that score. Right, so that, that plate of beef there represents the confluence of a lot of different things. Yeah, uh, yeah. At the time. And we had a question about Dick's uh, occupation. He's a boot black, right? Shushan right, boy. he's a Shushan boy. He is, uh, by all appearances, an orphan. Uh, we don't learn much about his family. He's homeless, he sleeps in the streets. Uh, he find shelter where we can. Uh, he's at the bottom of the heap. Okay. Well, shall we move on then? Sure. Uh, we can spend a lot of time on uh, this as on everything this evening, and I, I apologize to participants for having to move us along. But um, as your comments indicated, there is an awful lot to deal with this, in, this, in this period, so I'm throwing you out little things to think about later. Here's the next part of that same um, passage. Okay, shall we put that on the table? Um, <laughs> so to speak. Let's okay. put that on. No pun intended there. Dick had scarcely been served when he espied a boy about his own size standing at the door looking wistfully into the restaurant. This was Johnny Nolan, a boy of 14 who was engaged in the same profession as Ragged Dick. His wardrobe was in very much the same condition as Dick's. Had your breakfast, Johnny? inquired Dick, cutting off a piece of steak. No. Come in then. Here's room for you. I ain't got no money, said Johnny, looking a little enviously at his more fortunate friend. Come in, I'll stand treat this morning. Johnny Nolan was no wise slow to accept this invitation and was soon seated beside Dick. What do you have, Johnny? Same as you. Cup of coffee and beefsteak, ordered Dick. These were promptly brought, and Johnny attacked them vigorously. 
Okay, same question. What does this passage tell us about Dick? And I see some answers popping up in the chat already here. Okay, well, we know about uh, he's very kind, he's giving, uh, he's, uh, he's willing to work hard, he has sympathy, he's generous. Uh, Johnny perhaps is not as hard working, was honest, and so Dick let him uh, join him. Uh, industrious and generous, he knows how Johnny feels, so he's empathetic, kind-hearted. Uh, it requires a job for some income, but that income doesn't necessarily, these come going by so fast I can't read them, it doesn't necessarily combine <laughs> the circumstances since they're wearing the same clo quality clothes, obviously thrifty enough to have income to share. And of course, also here too, uh, Dick is already sort of recognized as a senior member of the firm here. You know, he's, yeah, yeah. he's the guy eating and he, and he helps Johnny. So I, I think we've got a lot of good comments here to work with. Henry, what do you think? We do. And, and uh, one of the things that Alger does in this novel, as in, in several others, is to further characterize his hero, his, his central character, by contrast with a lot of other uh, people. And uh, the, the, in this case, the contrast in Johnny Nolan is a boy who is a lot like Dick, uh, but who is not as hardworking, not as uh, ambitious, uh, not as savvy about his job, and therefore is less successful. Shortly after this passage that I just gave you on the screen here, there's a place where Alger makes that point explicitly, comparing them um, directly and, and noting the, the way in which Dick is more successful than the other. There are other characters in the book that represent bad boys, um, there is a, a, a particular villain amongst his circle of, of friends named Mickey McGuire. Uh, here we get back to that theme of immigration again. There are adults who are good and bad as well. One of the ways in which Dick succeeds is through benefactors, through mentors who recognize his qualities and help him along the way. So the idea here is that you can't just make it on your own but that the city contains people who will recognize talent and character uh, and, and help you up the ladder if you have the right qualities and you take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. There are adult characters who are bad in this, in this story as well, who are crooked. Some of them are wealthy. So uh, Ratio Alger is offering a kind of critique of uh, selfish people of great wealth. At the same time, he's talking about what you need to rise out of poverty. We have a really good question here. Were, our, uh, were, were there heroines at this time? Uh, Ragged Dick is a, is a masculine figure in the city, and his world is masculine. Uh, were, there, were there novels uh, written about uh, women in the city? Excellent question. And actually, um, there are female figures in Ragged Dick. Uh, when I teach this book in my own, there's another passage which we don't have available to us right now. Uh, another passage later on where Dick and yet another of his young male companions um, encounter a woman on a streetcar. Uh, she is clearly a negative example of femininity. She's rude. Uh, she's unperceptive. She accuses one of the boys of being a thief when he isn't. Uh, she has bad manners. And all the other people on the streetcar side with the boys against her. There is also a passage uh, later on in which Dick gets invited to dinner at a middle class household. Uh, the wife and mother is a, a perfect example of uh, uh, the way women should be, according to Alger. And there's a little girl, a little younger than Dick, um, who is uh, clearly being groomed for um, womanhood, ladyhood, but uh, who has some things to learn. So yes, there are female examples. Alger wrote primarily about boys. He wrote a couple of novels that are about little girls, but mostly he was interested in writing about boys. We have a question here about Dick's ethnicity. Can we characterize that at all? All-American boy, native-born white kid. Um, and I pointed out Mickey McGuire. There are other examples in this book and others of uh, Alger's contrast between what he views as strong American virtues and some not-so-strong characteristics of, uh, of immigrant groups. Okay. Alger, Alger was not without his prejudices. Uh, about different kinds of people. Okay, well, shall we move on then? Sure, sure. Okay, let, let me just uh, point out some things about what we've seen already. There, We have a lot of examples from the middle of the 19th century of the kind of cities that Americans were living in then, uh, small but growing very fast, already trying to come to grips with some of the problems of big city status as with Central Park in New York. Um, 
uh, offering lots of opportunities for people and even more in the fictional accounts of people like Horatio Alger. Uh, scary in some ways, but still, at least in, in, in the terms that people like to think, navigable, manageable. Uh, if you're a good person and you work hard, you can find opportunity in the city. What's happening in the late 19th century is there are a lot of things coming into play that challenge that somewhat rosy view. Um, and uh, we're going to have to encounter some of them along the way here. So what happens in the period after 1865 is what economists and historians often call the Second Industrial Revolution, uh, which involves the large-scale production of steel for the first time, which involves the extensive use of railway transportation, which involves the exploitation of petroleum and its refinement into an ever-increasing array of products, uh, and which in general involves a huge increase in the scale of workplaces and in cities that house them. These are two images from the Monongahela Valley near Pittsburgh. And um, I'd like you to think about these images in contrast with those earlier images that we saw. Okay, how about that? Now, the earlier images were bird's eye views. Uh, bird's eye views. Again, we're down on ground level. Uh, much less linear. Buildings and roads are not as carefully planned. Uh, we notice that there, is, there are more smokestacks. Uh, environmental disaster. One one participant comments, it's not flat. Now, this is the Nongahela Valley. It's, it's a hilly, mountainous. Uh, now we're beginning to see what those what those residential um, buildings look like close up. Living conditions of working Americans. Here we have congestion. Uh, let's see what else we have. Workers are part of the machine. It's dirty. And, and the industry is swallowing up the land and moving up the hills. Much more complicated roadways. Uh, this all represents technological advance. We have garbage in the trees. I didn't see that, but nonetheless, uh, housing was provided by the mills. Where are the people? There are, there are a few people in the picture on the right, but uh, yeah, people are, are not the outs. Uh, uh, are not out uh, in in um, great uh, great abundance here. So Henry, are we still working on an A here? Uh, you're working on an A straight through here. Uh, let me point out some things in the bigger landscape picture. First of all, it's smoky, or as we would say, smoggy. Uh, this is a nice illustration of what's happening to air quality in the region near Pittsburgh. Later in the 20th century, Pittsburgh is going to become a major target of air pollution controls. But in the latter part of the 19th century, that's not on the agenda. What you see here, this whole row of smokestacks, um, is the smokestacks of a, of a whole series of blast furnaces. Um, all of these railroads and roadways have been carved out by the steel companies uh, to supply the needs of the normal, enormous production plants down here in the valley. There is a river in here. This is the Monongahela River, although you might not even notice it that it first glance, um, and you will notice that it has been narrowed but put in a channel, and of course it's filthy. Um, this housing up here on the hill, and the houses down here in a little bit of the valley, um, are these houses here. This is the, the place where the workers lived. Um, this is a landscape that's coming to resemble what Americans feared. This is the kind of thing they knew was happening in Manchester and in Birmingham and other places in Europe and in England. Um, and in the second industrial revolution, boom, it is here in the United States in a big way. Uh, this was shocking to people uh, coming of age in the late 19th century. They had never been able to see anything like this before. This, is, this dwarfs even the scale of a Manchester or a Birmingham. Um, and of course, it betokens enormous increases in production but it also brings shocking living conditions and a lot of trouble um, for the workers who are low paid, hard worked. Many of the people who lived in these houses worked 12, 14, 16 hour shifts in very dangerous conditions. A lot of them are immigrants. Um, and the, the whole idea of rising up the ladder, Horatio Alger style, is just not even remotely possible for a lot of the people in, in these houses. Well, let, me, let me pose a question here. If, if an immigrant came to this country for economic opportunity and found himself or herself in these conditions, would they consider that an improvement from their village in Europe, or would they not? 
it's improvement in some ways and, and not in others. Um, one of the problems with the late 19th century is that conditions are bad everywhere in the Western world. Uh, a lot of people who came to Pittsburgh uh, were from Eastern Europe. That's part of the so-called new immigration of the late 19th century. Um, many of them had been pushed off the land by the transformation of uh, land into other purposes there. Uh, they're all very, very poor, uh, and the possibility of work at all is an improvement uh, over the prospect of starvation in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, what they're getting into is conditions that they're very poorly prepared um, to deal with. Um, in the 1880s, there were studies done in these mills near Pittsburgh uh, looking at the, the, the fate of immigrants who came into them. One of the studies found that uh, amongst the Eastern European immigrants um, in the steel mills, um, more than a quarter who arrived in the United States were either dead or maimed for life in, within one year after their arrival in the United States. So uh, was it better? Was it worse? It's hard to say. Okay. All right. Well, shall we move on then? Got it. Sure. A little over half an hour. If we go a little over time, I don't think people will mind. Here we have okay. an interesting picture. Now we're back in the city. <laughs> I didn't even pose a discussion section a question for this <laughs> for this picture because it's there's so many things to look at here. Uh, we're back in New York. This is a picture taken uh, in the Lower East Side in in Ragged Dick's neighborhood, the neighborhood where he was. Here's a bunch of kids, bunch of children um, of the same kind of social standing as Ragged Dick was, and this is not quite 40 years later. Uh, in New York City, what do you say? What do you see here? And I, I see someone talking about showing it to their <laughs> to their students. And you, yeah. you can you can do all kinds of things with this picture of the students. And someone noticed, that, uh, you know, the streets paved with gold myths, but no, the streets are paved with dead horses. Right. Uh, Not to mention horse manure. What are they going to do with the dead horse? Is it dead? Yes, it is dead. Uh, <laughs> many Americans at this time uh, wouldn't have liked this either. Uh, coming obsession with sanitation, clean streets. Anglo-Saxons, where are the southern sharecroppers who converged on the city? We'll talk about that, I think, in a moment. Um, cities, uh, kids are without shoes, playing in the gutter, children supervising themselves. Very hard for kids to understand, contemporary children to understand that this is New York City. Um, question we, we can get to is, that was this picture staged? Okay, I think we, um, uh, I think we get a sense that this is uh, this is um, this is the really the, the down on the ground view of the city, and it it, it contrasts with that nice clean ordered view that we talked about earlier. Right. Uh, you wanna you wanna help us parse this one out? Oh yeah. sure. Um, so, I mean, some of the things are obvious. These are poor kids. This, the environment they live in is uh, dirty. Uh, they are playing in a gutter next door to a dead horse, and seemingly completely unfazed by the carcass lying there. Um, one of the things I might point out is that that carcass probably wasn't there very long after the picture was taken because dead horses had value in, in New York. Um, and there were scavengers who would collect them uh, reasonably quickly and get them out of there. You can use the horse to make uh, glue, the, the skin and the hair are worth things and so forth and so on. Um, there's a big problem in the latter part of the 19th century because the whole city is dependent on horses at this point. Um, New York had 130,000 horses, working horses in 1900. Uh, one of the problems is the fact that horses produce animal waste. Um, and a good healthy horse will produce seven tons of manure per year. Multiply seven times 130,000 and you get some idea of the street cleaning problem in New York. Um, all these things are parts of urban life that you can sort of get a glimpse of through a window, uh, the window of this picture. Um, the kids are, uh, somebody asked what's the stage, and it's really hard to say. Um, given the kind of cameras that were in use in the day, we don't have any kind of, you know, um, motor-driven Nikons here. They're big, clunky, clumsy things. You got to set them up on a tripod. Takes a little while to get ready for the picture. So there's ample opportunity for staging, and we know that Jacob Rees staged some of his pictures. But what he did was to try to uh, stage things that were in fact occurring on the streets all the time. 
Uh, and I can't tell whether this is staged or not. The little boy who is closest to us here, this kid right down here, is pointing at the camera, which indicates to me that he's kind of surprised to see uh, taking his picture. And that means okay. Jason Moniasa and Kevin. We had we had one question. Uh, do, first of all, do we know who the photographer? Uh, is? I don't I know find who the attribute. photographer is. Um, and the 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 place where I got the source where I got this some of this, there is a wonderful book um, by a man named Clay McShane, M C H A N E. Uh, and its co-author is Joel Tarr, T-A-R-R, -R, called The Horse in the City. Uh, the subtitle is Living Machines in the 19th Century. And it's about all the ways in which horses and urban life meshed with each other and the indispensability of horses uh, to the environment of the city, the way in which humans interacted with them in a lot of different ways. So um, this is a, is, a, is a wonderful little uh, uh thing for students to look at, in part because it raises as many questions as it answers, as, as you all are noting. We had, we had a question, let me, let me go back to that question, about southern migration Yeah, urban north. Now we know 1920, by, you get, by the time you get to 1920, you're in the middle of the, of the Great Migration. You've got lots of African Americans coming from the south to the north. But what about white migration? Was that from the south to the north? Was that going on during this period to any great degree? Uh, at, at the end of this period, it's going on uh, to a significant degree. A lot of the forces by 1920. That, yeah, well, by the 19 teens. Okay. A All lot right. of the forces that drove African Americans north, uh, which had to do with the mechanization of agriculture and reorganization of sharecropping, uh, affected poor whites as well as poor black people, and they moved off the land. Of course, uh, poor black people had the added incentive of getting out of a system of Jim Crow. But there are, are factors pushing that kind of white migration as well. In the time when, at the point where this picture was taken in 1905, the major streams of migration to a place like New York are not going to include many uh, Southern Appalachians, um, Southerners or Appalachians. A lot of these, who knows what these kids are, but they're probably immigrants. Uh, New York was a major magnet for the new migration of the late 19th century, Eastern Europeans, uh, Mediterranean people. Uh, that's more than likely the sources of these kids here. Mm -hmm. We have a question about the Great Migration during World War I. It, it, it was going on at that period, but it, it, it continued. Uh, the, the end mark is kind of in dispute, isn't it, Henry, quickly? Well, it depends on how you define it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, there's some people talk about the first Great Migration in the World War I period, 1920s period, and then the, the interruption by the Depression and World War II uh, when you have a, a resumption and a second great migration afterward. I'd like to point out, however, that um, in the biggest cities, in the places that were in that ranking of population on the chart, there are already significant African-American populations um, in the late 19th century uh, and at the turn of the century. In 1900, there were already 30,000 black people living in Chicago, about the same number uh, living in uh, New York. And thanks to, uh, and even more in Philadelphia and Baltimore, thanks to uh, uh, the workings of segregation, most of those people lived relatively close to each other. So you've already got significant kind of uh, little cities within the city of African Americans as well as of immigrants. In this okay. Well, shall we move on then? Sure. Lots and lots of things to talk about here. We could dwell on any one of these slides for a great period of time. I mentioned um, that the conditions of the late 19th century were, were shocking for a lot of people who had no basis of comparison earlier. And they're shocking not only in a negative way, but also in a positive way. Um, as Richard knows, um, these are images of one of my favorite machines from the late 19th century. Um, these are two pictures of the same steam engine, uh, which was built to drive all the machinery at the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia that celebrated the, the centennial of the revolution. Um, this was the Corliss steam engine. And you can see, uh, get some sense of the scale of this thing from the pictures. It's enormous. Uh, it stands 40 feet uh, above the floor. And there are parts of it that go below the floor. You can see this big flywheel here um, that drops down below uh, the floor line. Uh, it has two enormous cylinders. It has giant walking beams. This is a, sort of the pinnacle of steam uh, technology in the late 19th century. 
Uh, one of the big changes is, of course, going to be the adoption of electric power in the late 19th century, but a lot of things are still run by steam. And uh, the, the machine here, which drove the World's Fair, and here you see it inside the World's Fair building, uh, was uh, in itself a marvel. People came to the fair to see lots of things, but one of the things they came to see was this engine. Um, so here we have a nice example of the second industrial revolution uh, perfecting the steam technology of the 19th century. Uh, imagine how you might have reacted uh, as a as a visitor to the fair to this kind of thing. Uh, and the question I asked there is, what does it just suggest about the period's attitude for technology? And I think I already answered my own question. <laughs> it, it shocked people. It inspired people. It was something they really liked. It, and I see the word frightening in um, uh, in the chat here. Yeah, it was frightening, uh, but it also was uh, something that people liked. One of the things that people said about this engine when they actually came to see it was that they were amazed at how quiet it was. They expected that something like this would make a huge racket, but it was so carefully designed that once it got started, uh, it moved uh, very quietly. It, it, it uh, chugged along back and forth, didn't make no noise, but no, not noise that, that seemed appropriate to its size. Mm -hmm. Someone asked what it did. This machine powered a lot or all of the other power exhibits within this building. Is that right? Yes. Right. Okay, right. so it was okay. just meant for the World's Fair. And it's, the, the fair is in part an exhibit of industrial technology. So there are a lot of things in here, machines that needed to be made to work. And the motive source um, for the whole thing was this enormous steam engine. Okay. It also okay. drove pumps that supplied water and that kind of thing. Right. Okay, we've got about half an hour, Henry. So shall oh, we've we got to zip along here. Uh, we talked about immigration. And um, again, all of this is by way of talking about how cities changed in this period, this late 19th century period. This is a chart of statistics that I got from the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and what it shows is immigration over to the United States over a very long period of time from the early 19th century down to the recent past. Um, and what uh, you see here is back in the uh, 1840s, 50s, there's a, a sudden uh, sharp increase, which represents the potato famine migration from Ireland and migration from Germany and Scandinavia. There's a dip during the Civil War and uh, a little bit of a rise, but not much during the 1870s when there's economic uh, trouble here and then, then a, a sinking. And then in the 80s and in the early part of the 20th century, there's a huge spike upward uh, in uh, immigration to the United States. These are not only, it's not only a, a numerical increase, but uh, as I mentioned before, this is when large numbers of people from groups that had not played a big role before come to the cities of the United States, Italians, Greeks, Russians, Poles, uh, many people of different kinds of religion than what many, most Americans are used to at this point. Uh, we have a significant Jewish immigration. We have a Eastern Orthodox immigration. And a lot of these people um, established what were then called colonies within the cities of the United States. So this is another part of the big change, very different from the cities of before, um, producing a whole new kind of urban environment for uh, people alive. Uh, at the time. Okay, uh, I think this chart is self-explanatory, so let's move along here. Um, what I want to do now in the next few slides is to talk about ways in which this new urban environment um, had lots of different kinds of meaning for for people within the city, both positive and negative. This is a, 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 a very fuzzy picture, but uh, what I, I wanted to show you is, is new capabilities, new technological capabilities here, um, and try to ask you to imagine and get your students to imagine how newcomers to the city, those people from, who are immigrants from abroad, uh, migrants from the country, uh, people coming from parts of the, of the world where there weren't any big cities, would react to the things that they see in the 1880s and the 1890s. What you've got here is a, an inclined uh, tram, and, and this is outside Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and these platforms here, uh, one of them is moving up, the other one is moving down on parallel tracks, and each one of them is carrying a streetcar here. These are streetcars. 
Uh, and if you could see a little better, you'd see there's also a horse here who pulls the streetcar. <coughs> and what they've essentially done uh, is to connect the streetcar system of Cincinnati, which is down here in the valley, downtown Cincinnati, uh, with the hilltops that surround Cincinnati. It's a way of extending the car line um, to places where the streetcar could not by itself go. Um, so uh, what do you think uh, people might say about this when they saw it for the first time? Okay. And while we're waiting for responses, we had a question about the date of this. This would be about circa 1900, right? It's probably just a little earlier than that. Uh, a little earlier? Okay. Yeah. All right. And then we also had another question. You mentioned people, immigrants moving into colonies. Yeah. Is there a distinction between a colony and a ghetto? Oh, really good question. Um, the colonies referred in general to the clusterings of lots of different kinds of newcomers from abroad. Uh, the word ghetto, which is an Italian word that originally uh, described, beginning in the late Middle Ages, uh, quarters of European cities that were um, places where Jewish people were required to live, came to the United States with the Jewish migration of the late 19th, early 20th century. That's when we first find that word being used over here. Um, and when it first came, it was it was used in the same way as an area, as designating an area of Jewish settlement. Um, of course, it later became a term to be used for African-American communities. That happened well down into the 20th century. I, one of, that's one of the things I'm most curious about in my research. The earliest usage in that sense I've found is from the 1930s. Okay. All right. And we had a number of questions here about the uh, tram. Uh, is this the beginning of the suburbs? And then uh, was this uh, transportation affordable uh, to the masses? Was, were they dangerous? How did people respond to these? Isn't that a question? Were there any trans public transportation systems like this in Europe? So a whole set of really good questions. Yes, uh, excellent questions. And uh, I, I will try to pick all the ones I can. Um, it's not a beginning of the suburbs because they were already – suburbs that were accessible by, and especially in flatter places, by streetcars, by steam railroads uh, outside many cities in the United States. But what this does is to, first of all, extend the reach of public transportation. Um, it, it, the reason why I think this is a, piece, a picture before 1900 is that I think this is a horse-drawn streetcar. Uh, and starting in the 1880s and 1890s, the streetcars got electrified. Uh, so you couple electric streetcars with the ability to hoist them up uh, significant distances, and you're uh, making suburbs go out farther than they could before. Mm -hmm. um, so you get a, a, a more extensive, more physically extensive kind of, um, uh, of, of suburban expansion than you had before. Um, the tramways were not particularly dangerous, like any kind of, of mechanical apparatus. There were accidents. Uh, there are episodes in which the cables that uh, supported these things broke and there would be a catastrophic collapse or slide back down the track. But uh, by and large, they were about as safe as the streetcars on, on flat areas. Um, and I can't remember any of the other questions about that. Well, I think, I think we've, we've drained this picture dry. Shall we move ahead then? Yeah, let's, let's move along. Um, and uh, so, uh, Richard, I'm going to call on your talents as a reader once again here. Okay. My father and a neighbor, old Uncle Bill Brandon, had to go up to the big town, which was Chicago, on some sort of business. And I suppose I'd been extra diligent in doing chores, weeding potatoes, killing worms on the tomato plants or something. And father rewarded me by taking me along. You can imagine what a time I had seeing things I'd never seen before. In fact, had only dreamed about or heard about. Curiosity wasn't the name for it. Speechless incredulity came nearer describing my emotions. But when I saw my first trolley car slipping along Cottage Grove Avenue in Chicago, slipping along without horses or engine or apparent motive power, well, it was just too darn much for me. I didn't know what to think. Uncle Bill could understand horses, hogs, cattle, steam engines, army mules, and rowboats, and such things but that trolley car with a little spinning wheel at the end of the pole spinning along against the electric wire above it was too much for him. So here we have a passage that in some ways answers the question I raised about the picture uh, that you just saw. Uh, these are people from the country come to the big city 
And they are just astonished by seeing electrically driven trolley cars for the first time. Um, I've used this this passage or one similar to it actually uh, with my students, and they find uh, two things they notice about it. First of all, the it, it confirms in some ways their prejudice against the country that the country is full of people who are ignorant. Until I remind them that this is new for everybody in this period, uh, but it also gives some sense of uh, how simple movement from the country to the city could produce something so shocking. Uh, in, a, in a, an era when there's very little communication of information of the kind that we think of as as, um, as part of the stuff of life. Uh, very few pictures, certainly no television or movies yet. So what you're seeing here is uh, a, a window into a different kind of gap between the country and the city. What struck me about this, uh, Henry, was the emphasis on seeing. I mean, this yeah, yeah. city provided a rich visual culture, richer perhaps than the, well, richer, I think, than the rural areas and small towns. And people, he's looking. I mean, he's just, uh, you know, agape. A His eyes are wide. He's soaking it all in. It's such a tremendously diverse and rich visual culture. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, again, another nice little way of getting students to, to, to understand a complicated phenomenon um, through examining the experience of individuals and what they say about it. Um, time is slipping away, so I want to jump to the next slide, which is two pictures of two cities, one huge, uh, one not so huge, at the same time in 1905. Um, and again, what do you see in these pictures? Okay, what do we see here? I think you could probably teach the entire seminar just using the picture. Uh, probably. Uh, right. But crowded. Cables. Okay. What else do we have here? Telegraph wires. Trolley lines. Oh, man. We're getting into technology. Taller buildings. Okay. Crowds in the street. All right. So like um, the congestion, like 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 Ragged Dick's uh, platter of beef, this represents <laughs> the confluence of a whole lot of things. Advertisement. There you go. Yep. Advances galore. Chicago's really crafty. Jaywalking. <laughs> Order and chaos. <laughs> Electricity, women are visible. Yeah, okay. Yep. Women women are are I, think, I think we still keep our A here, don't we? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you guys have captured a lot of the stuff. Uh, one of you noticed that there are telephone wires in this picture. Uh, that's another big change in the city full of implications, of course, along with the electric wires for the trolley. Um, one of the things, I, the reasons I picked the Dayton picture over here um, is because Chicago is a huge city. Uh, one would expect to see tall buildings, a lot of crowding and so forth. Not as crowded in Dayton, but you've got, what, an 11-story building here uh, in a medium-sized city in Ohio. And in both cases, in the big city and in Dayton, what you've got is another manifestation of new technology. Uh, this kind of building here, you couldn't have built that back in 1850. This is a, um, a steel-framed building. Uh, in which there are elevators to take people to the upper floors. Uh, an 11-story walk-up would have been unthinkable. So you don't get buildings much about six or seven stories in the early part of the 19th century. And now you've got these things that are called skyscrapers. Uh, the extensive use of uh, electric power in all sorts of venues, including in these elevators by 1905, uh, as well as a lot of other things. But of course, you've still got our friend the horse here working away in the city. Uh, you've got to think of horses as citizens, as important parts of the working class of the city. Um, and they're still there in 1905. We have a question about streetlights. I can see a streetlight in the Chicago picture. It's sort of in the uh, off to the center left, up in the upper part of the picture. Yeah, there it is. But in Dayton, I mean, I don't. Is there, there are street lights there in Dayton? Uh, there probably are. I don't see any in this picture. Uh, there, most cities had a, had a kind of mixture of uh, electric and gas lights at this uh -huh. point. The idea uh -huh. of gas lights goes back to the middle of the 19th century. Right, right. Electric lights are gradually creeping in. Right. And I think there are horses in the Dayton picture. We just don't see them. There's a, I think we can make out a horse in the front of that wagon that's sort of in the yep. center yep. foreground. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Moving right along so these, here. These pictures really summarize so much of what's going on. Right. Another good shot of the city. Yep. Um, this, uh, I want to give credit where credit is due. This is Richard's idea, this picture right here. I love this picture. Um, here's you have the young lady uh, in front of a department store window. Let me just point out one bit of technological uh, demonstration here. This thing here. 
this giant window. That's plate glass. Uh, it wasn't until the latter part of the 19th century that plate glass could be manufactured in sheets that big uh, at a relatively low price. Um, and in order to have a plate glass window, you have to have an iron or steel frame for your building to open up a big enough space uh, to put it in. So what you're getting is a, a confluence of technology here that's part of the creation of what we think of as store windows in a department store. And again, I think you have that emphasis on the visual culture. I mean, this girl, this woman is sightseeing. She's, she's looking, you yep. know, the act of seeing once again. What does this tell us about, about clothing in the city that's, that's very prominent in this picture? Uh, well, you've got the clothing in the, in the, on the mannequins in the window is clothing for people of high income. It's hard to tell what this girl is wearing. Uh, her skirts are being blown by the wind here, and she's obviously in the rain, uh, probably not feeling too great at the moment. And I, what I see in this picture is not just uh, window shopping, but longing, some, uh, uh, someone who wants something that she probably can't afford. Um, yeah. uh, the other thing, though, somebody mentioned the presence of women in the picture uh, of Chicago on the street. And one of the things that's happened partly due to department stores in the late 19th century is that um, – there are a great many more women who are coming downtown uh, on streetcars, on the train, to shop. And shopping as a kind of recreational activity for uh, middle and upper, upper class people. And also as, as um, a sort of wishful activity for people who, who really can't afford the stuff in the windows. Uh, you may remember, some of you have read uh, Sister Carrie, one of the... Uh, big motives for Sister Carrie on her downward slip morally is that she wants to buy things she sees in the stores. We had a question here about democratizing um, the uh, the ability to uh, buy clothes. Like, is this a democratizing influence? You need not be rich to know the fashions and to buy buy them occasionally. That raises the issue of class here. And what what does this tell us about class markers in a city? That you're no longer living in a small town where everybody knows who you are. You're now uh, yep. you know perhaps an anonymous individual in the city. How do you mark your class in a city now? Yeah, well, that's, that's a really good question. And one of the things that's happened is that thanks to um, industrial production, mass production, what you're getting is what we have in our world today, actually, to some extent. Uh, there are very high quality and expensive goods and clothing, but there are also cheap knockoffs that are, are not as durable, uh, that will wear out quicker, that are not made of as, as, as good materials, but they're accessible at a lower price. So it's harder to tell on the street. Um, who is really a person of wealth and who is not. So uh, the markers change. Um, a lot of the markers in, in, the, in the late 19th century have to do with uh, other kinds of things than clothing. Do you have a carriage? And ultimately, do you have an automobile? Um, where do you live? What is your house like? How can you spend your time? Can you go to the opera? All those kinds of things are, uh, are, are, are marks of what rich people can do, prosperous people can do, and um, poorer people cannot. Mm -hmm. We've had some discussion here about the, <clears throat> the wet pavement. Um, if we were art historians and art critics, I suppose we could really go into raptures over that. Um, <laughs> I think it may be just that the artist really enjoyed the play of light on the pavement, but it does seem to, uh, to bathe the woman viewer in light and, and bring her into the, uh, the play class window. And I think perhaps that, that reflection is where we might all come up with this sense of longing that she feels, although yeah, I'm not yeah. sure about that. And it's also, the, I mean, I think that what it shows is that, again, there's that light and darkness theme. Yeah. The light is, all, is coming from inside the store, uh, and it's very bright in there, and it's shining off the rain in the, in the, on the sidewalk. Right. right. I, I think you could get a lot of mileage out of this with your students, and I, I hope that some of you will bring this into your classes. Okay, Henry, should we move on? Yeah, we, we, we have, have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, one of the things that um, came out of this period and that was widely remarked as a, a, a um, particularly American achievement was the amusement park. And Fred Thompson, whose picture you see here, was the creator of the, the arguably the first real big amusement park kind of um, ride, permanent amusement park ride in the United States on, on Coney Island. Um, 
Shall we read this passage? Okay. I'll do my best Fred Thompson imitation here. The difference between the theater and the big amusement park is the difference between the Sunday school and the Sunday school picnic. The people are the same. The spirit and the environment are wholly different. It is harder to make the picnic successful than successfully to conduct a session of the school, and it is harder to make a success of the big amusement park than of a theater. There isn't any irreverence in this comparison with Sunday school, for if the amusement park doesn't attract people who are interested in the Sunday school, it isn't going to succeed. So Luna Park is just like Sunday school, right? <laughs> well, let's, to answer that question, let's look at the next slide. <laughs> These are photographs from Coney Island in the early uh, part of the 20th century. Um, and we have segued into uh, a series of slides here that have to do with the way people experience this new urban environment, this new big city uh, in, in environment. Um, and you've got the five young ladies on the left who are doing something I don't think they would do at home, uh, something they probably wouldn't do on Fifth Avenue. Um, but there they are um, in uh, on the beach in Coney Island. Escapism, says somebody. Yes, indeedy. Um, and then you have on the right-hand side Luna Park, which is uh, one of the the is, is Fred Thompson's founding uh, contribution on Coney Island. It became it had a lot of competitors, uh, and they all had the same kind of fantastical. There's the word being used: quality, bright lights big city, a uh, certain toleration of behavior that probably is not appropriate elsewhere from people who would do things at Coney Island. We have diary accounts from people who went to Coney Island, uh, upper middle class, respectable, well-behaved people who suddenly find themselves carried away and go dashing into the ocean fully clothed and so forth and so on. Um, sorry. Well, that, he, uh, 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 Thompson appealed, he, he likened it to a Sunday school because he wanted those respectable middle class folks, right? Right, that's right. They got to there, they got to Coney Island on those streetcars that are right. now running on electricity. And he wants people to think that going to Coney Island is like going to a Sunday school picnic, right? Mm -hmm. It is within the realm of permissible behavior, right. even the though. Yeah, even though it is, you know, stretching the limits a whole lot by the standards of the 19th century, um, this is what you get. This is a, a, part, a nice illustration, a set of nice illustrations of that idea of the city as a place where, where there is uh, a new kind of liberty, a freedom, where you can uh, do things that you wouldn't do in small town USA, uh, where you can do things you couldn't even do a generation earlier uh, in the big city, and you can take advantage of technology that just wasn't there. Okay, moving along. I'm watching the clock. Um, politics. George Washington Plunkett um, is one of the famous uh, machine politicians of the late 19th, early 20th century, um, partly because he gave a bunch of interviews to a newspaper reporter who wrote down the philosophy of George Washington Plunkett in a book called Plunkett of Tammany Hall uh, about the nature of politics. Now, Plunkett was um, the child of immigrants, rose to a position of influence in Tammany Hall in New York, had a particularly uh, particular philosophy about uh, the accusations of graft and corruption in, um, in politics. Do we have time for, to read this, Richard, or is it too long? I think it may be too long. I, I think this okay. is a number of people mentioned this in the forum that uh, they use Plunkett. Um, yeah. So I think people are familiar with it. Why don't we go ahead and, Henry, okay. what are we looking for? If we were going to use this with our students, what would we be after? Uh, what we'd be after is uh, a comparison between Plunkett and men of business, whom he is comparing him, himself with. Um, and what he says is that I'm basically just doing what people do in the in the business world. Um, I see my opportunities and I took them. And he makes a distinction between dishonest graft, which um, he characterizes here as ha having to do with connections to the world of, of crime and especially organized crime, uh, and says I'm engaged in honest graft, which means uh, finding out information and acting on it in the same way that 
uh, stock speculators or real estate state speculators might do in the same period. Um, remember that there are very few regulations in this period against insider trading, as we call it, uh, in various markets. And he's suggesting that just because he's an insider in politics doesn't mean he shouldn't take advantage of the information that he has. These are, of course, themes that are with us still today. Uh, but it's in this period that they get a, a, a big hearing. And, and Plunkett becomes, uh, a for some people, a symbol of all that's wrong with the big city. And for others, another example of the kind of opportunities that are opening up, up for um, ambitious, smart, upwardly mobile people. Uh, you can see Plunkett in some ways as a kind of slightly less honest, ragged dick. That's what I was going to say. We have a, a slightly corrupt, ragged dick politician here. That's right. Um, we've got a couple of pictures here that have to do with politics that contrast uh, politics in the small town. This is a George Calabingham picture from uh, the middle of the 19th century about the county election. And this is a John Sloan picture um, from the early 20th century uh, about election night. And there's a certain amount of celebrating going on in, in both cases and a certain amount of drinking going on in both cases. But you'll notice this one portrays a much rowdier atmosphere um, than the county election picture from about 50 years. Yeah, I think uh, this would make an interesting contrast with students. And we've already got an interesting point here. Uh, somebody points out party politics in the city of more <laughs> Right. Uh, but here, too, we have women are involved in the city. And yeah. uh, that's true. You don't see any women in the uh, in the other uh, in the picture on the left. Um, and, and artistically, I mean, the picture on the left, you know, it's, it's framed. It's a scene. It's, it's yeah. almost like on a stage. And then the one on the right, the crowd is coming out of the picture frame and it's emerging toward you. It's much more vibrant and lively. And the central figure is this woman in red right, right in, in the red. middle here. Yeah. Um, the one of the things to keep in mind is that we're not at women's suffrage yet uh, on a national basis. But this is a period in which women are increasingly uh, getting involved in politics. Uh, and in some places, a good many places, actually at the local level, there are laws that allow women to vote uh, for things like school board uh, and for other kinds of offices that uh, particularly affect the lives of women, mothers, and children. So um, there's a kind of transition going on here. And of course, you've got women in public. and not too thoroughly clad in the right-hand picture, by contrast with the very, almost all-male scene on, on the left. Um, OK. Tick, tick, tick. Um, this is a document uh, that that's, comes from, I believe, the Library of Congress website. And it's from a memoir um, about uh, a, from a man who lived in, in New York. He's remembering later in the 20th century Ginsburg's candy store. And uh, the description here, I'm not going to get Richard to read it because of time pressures, but the description here is of, of a place that where all kinds of business is going on. You'll notice down at the bottom, one of the discussion questions I suggested is how many different kinds of business are conducted out of this store? And there is, of course, the sale of candy, but that's only the, the smallest. Um, kind of business going on here. There's political transactions. There's people uh, engaged in those political transactions to get jobs. Uh, there's a numbers runner. There's all kinds of stuff going on here in the candy store. It becomes a kind of neighborhood center in a lot of ways. And it's not, uh, the, the, one of the questions is, is it comparable to rural or small town America? Um, a lot of these things are things that are possible only in the city, uh, where you've got a, a lot of different kinds of connections and opportunities. Again. This is how people how people are making use of this new urban environment of the late 19th, early 20th century, finding all kinds of ways um, to exploit it, to move up in it, to take advantage of things that are that weren't available there before. Uh, final final picture in this section um, is a Jacob Reese photo. Um, staged, not staged, I don't know, um, but uh, I don't think I would want to walk down this alley. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, how does this? Uh, <clears throat> we, we ask in our um, our discussion question. Compare the attitude toward the city expressed in this image with that expressed in Ragged Dick. How far have we come from uh, the 1860s? Or, or when was Ragged Dick published? 1868. 
1868. How far have we come since 1868? Uh, how, how do we see the city now? Talk about corruption in big city politics. There's actually more to the excerpt. Um, provide, uh, at Library of Congress provides questions, but I made up 10 of my own in response to another uh, question about uh, how did you position uh, one of the texts. Uh, people uh, want to know if it's staged. We don't know if it's staged. Um, <clears throat> A lot of Reese's pictures were what I would yeah. call semi-staged. In other words, they uh, he came upon people doing things he wanted to photograph, and he encouraged them to do it a little more picturesquely for the camera. Mm -hmm. So there doesn't seem to be much optimism uh, in this community. Um, what about Reese's uh, ad about his relationship with the people he photographed? Uh, did he have any, uh, Henry? Do you know? Well, when I um, talk about Jacob Reese in my class and get students to read and look at his pictures, I often set up a comparison between Reese and Jane Addams, um, who was starting Hull House at the same time he was um, writing How the, How the Other Half Lives. Uh, Jane Addams immersed herself in the world of the poor. Uh, that was the key, as she saw it, toward uh, learning about the neighborhood and being able to do anything constructive. Uh, Jacob Reese came to take pictures and to talk to people. So he knew a lot more about poor neighborhoods than most people in the United States, but um, he didn't stick around there very much. He did not try to, uh, what should I say, uh, become part of the neighborhood in any significant way. And there's always a certain kind of detachment in his pictures and in his writing from the people he's writing about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the passage from, um, uh, how the other half lives we include in the Gilded and Gritty and the uh, National Humanities Center's teaching anthology. I think is very good. It shows it shows the uh, narrator being kind of a mentor and taking you through the city and touring uh, these uh, uh, actually the worst part of, of this particular ghetto. So yeah. It's a yeah. Text. I, I would urge you, to, uh, urge you to use it with your students. What, what, let me let me uh, make one more point too. That book that I showed you the title page of Sunshine and Shadow way back in the beginning of our, our, our conversation this evening, um, also employs that kind of tour guide um, trope, uh, as do lots of other books in this period. It's a favorite way of for writers to take their readers on a vicarious journey into some place where uh, the readers are unlikely to go in real life. And, and, and Reese is building off of that. Um, it is, I think, instructive and says a lot about Reese's sophistication uh, to compare the way he does it with the way uh, it's done in earlier works like Sunshine and Shadow. Okay. Okay. We have only four more slides, I believe. Um, well, maybe I, I, I don't think I don't think anybody be bailing out, so we can. We can. <laughs> okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to raise with you is some some um, illustrations that help us understand um, reactions on a larger scale, because it seems to me that one of the things that happens in the from the 90s on uh, is that that sense of shock and uh, astonishment and surprise, both positive and neg negative, uh, becomes a sense of wanting to uh, diagnose and explain and explore and uh, fix a lot of things that are wrong with big cities in the United States. Um, and of course, um, one of the major uh, examples of that is Daniel Burnham's uh, plan for Chicago. Uh, this is a watercolor uh, by a very talented artist named Jules Guérin, who uh, produced a number of the pictures for Burnham's plan of Chicago in 1909. Um, let me just point out some things, uh, unpack this picture a little bit instead of asking you to, to say what you see. Um, this is Chicago's waterfront, as Burnham said it might be. Um, and what you've got here is a, a wholesale remaking of the Chicago that was already there, including a great deal of landfill, the creation of artificial islands and piers and harbors, uh, the, the manufacture of what's now Grant Park here uh, on the city's front doorstep, which was only in a, in a sort of gleam in some people's eye at the time. One of the most interesting things is, is that you've got this long, low facade of brightly lit buildings, low rise buildings relatively. So the skyscrapers that were already there in Chicago 
uh, some of which Daniel Burnham had designed, are kind of erased in this image of what Chicago might be like in the future. It's, it's a kind of, kind of Parisian version of the big city. But the thing that strikes me most about this is the scale. The idea that uh, what you want to do now is replan the whole city. You just don't want to just build a central park. Uh, what you want to do is to to change the um, uh, the whole layout of the place, make it more efficient, make it more attractive, uh, make it uh, get rid of a lot of the things that, um, that that people disliked about the city in this period, and of course make it pretty and attractive and electrically lit and so forth and so on. This image has some of the attributes of a kind of carnival picture to me. Um, brightly lit boats, uh, clearly a lot of people having fun, uh, you can imagine, looking at this picture and so forth. So I, I think in answer to your our discussion question, why did the artist make this image at nighttime? So we have two good comments, highlights <clears throat> the lighting and contrasts um, rural with urban. And then uh, let's see, nighttime hides the ills of daylight. We have a very good question, though. How typical of liberal progressive era reformers would Burnham be in his desire to transform the city like that? Um, well, I, I, uh, I'm a little little cautious about the use of the word liberal here because it didn't mean what it means to us uh, in, the, in this day. Um, Burnham would certainly have thought of himself as a progressive, and um, progressives were very taken with the idea of using the same kind of uh, innovative power that had been manifest in the Industrial Revolution, the same kind of application of science, the, the same kind of systematic use of um, data and knowledge to improve society and government. And so in that sense, he's a thoroughgoing progressive. Um, and uh, also like at least some progressives, he was not shy about the idea, and this makes him directly counter to the social Darwinist kind of way of thinking, not shy about the idea of using public power uh, at all levels um, to accomplish those ends. Um, the Burnham plan actually, insofar as it was implemented in Chicago, was mostly implemented by people in the private sector uh, who then persuaded politicians to um, pass laws that they wanted and allocate money that they wanted, but it's, it's the business community that that back to Burnham and tried to put through a lot of his ideas. Okay. All right. Well, shall we move on then? Sure. Um, this is the last slide, I believe, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll get Richard to read it. Okay. It is one of the great advances of modern science to have discovered that just simple, ordinary outdoor air is a most valuable health resource, that a balcony on a city street is a thousand times better than a room in a house closed for fear of drafts, curtain for fear of fading furniture, and lighted by a lamp. The state might be visualized <clears throat> as immersed in a great sea. Here and there, a city is sending up great clouds of dust, smoke, and foreign gases, which may be likened to city sewage <clears throat> rising from points at the bottom of the clear sea. Between these great sources of pollution run connecting roads, boulevards, railway, railways, each sending out all along its sinuous course dense currents of waste and contaminated air. Along these lines of pollution appear houses and factories, often emitting foul air themselves and completely surrounded by dense clouds of air sewage, only appearing to the view as sudden gusts blow the mass away. This sort of visualization will lead to the conclusion that even outside air is bad in the vicinity of cities. I find this quotation um, astonishing in a lot of ways um, because it's from 1911. Um, it's by a woman chemist at MIT um, and a, a person who described herself in 1911 as a human ecologist. Uh, and what she's doing here is the kind of um, analysis, appraisal, con a, a commentary that we are accustomed with from the late 20th and early 21st century. It's already, she's thinking about the natural setting um, on a very large scale, scale. She's thinking about ecological and what we would call environmental um, relationships. Um, in a way that would have, would have been wholly absent in the 19th century. 
Um, so I think this is a nice example of what the, all those transformations of the city in the late 19th century uh, made possible to a smart person who is trying to think about how they all relate one to another. She's a, um, a person trained in science in a way that nobody would have been done, it would have been, especially a woman back in the middle of the 19th century. MIT, by the way, was created in 1861. Um, and she is looking at how all the pieces fit together, how uh, the city and its environment and, and uh, the various transportation mechanisms that connect them and the problems of waste all fit together. So I, think, I think it's just amazing. Okay. Hey. Uh, are there any questions or comments about <clears throat> that last passage or anything else in the seminar? We have come to the end. <clears throat> Does the environmental concern expressed by TR influence this? Um, you might want to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, relationship between Theodore Roosevelt's environmental concerns and those of uh, uh, Ellen Richards. Yeah. Uh, she, actually, Ellen Richards and Teddy Roosevelt knew each other and, uh, and shared ideas. Um, Roosevelt was was what I would call more of a conservationist than an environmentalist. Um, he was also a very far-sighted person in many ways, and he recognized the need to um, prevent um, the destruction that might otherwise occur uh, of natural environments, of places that were threatened by uh, commercial or manufacturing interests. Uh, and he also recognized the 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 way in which those places could have a therapeutic influence for people who increasingly lived in big cities. Roosevelt himself, of course, was a city boy from New York. Um, but his way of thinking is not quite as um, sophisticated as Ellen Richards' way of thinking. And I, I think I would call her an environmentalist and him a conservationist. Right, right. And a um, um, participant notes here that instead of talking about the promise of technology, this speaks to the cost. So we do have that that uh, skeptical, critical uh, attitude creeping in here in 1911. Yep. And but I, I would also point out that it's not only talking about cost, but about about uh, the need to apply science uh, to finding remedies, to doing you know something better. Okay, so we've gone from <clears throat> um, cities in the 1860s that were just booming and just feeling, uh, you know, growing and out what we have now, where we need to bring science to bear on their on the problems that that growth uh, presents to us. Right. Right. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. We've gone well beyond our time. Uh, we, I hope we've addressed all of your questions. Uh, we urge you to use the forum, uh, continue to the, the discussion. Uh, we'll share uh, fresh approaches and so forth on that forum with each other. We'll monitor it until March 1st. And any questions or comments you have, uh, we'll take a look at those. If you have posed any questions, we'll pass them on to, uh, to Henry, and we'll be back in touch uh, to respond to those questions. So please keep the forum in mind. Let me remind you that our next Teaching with Primary Sources National Humanities Seminar will be on February 23rd at 7 p.m. It will be Opportunity Costs, the Perils and Profits of Assimilation, led by Joy Casson, a National Humanities Center fellow and a professor of American Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hope you'll all sign up for that and be back with us. Please submit your evaluations. As I said earlier, they're very important to us. And I want to thank Henry this evening for giving us a very fine seminar. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank, thank you. I had a, a great time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Great. And I want to thank all of you for your intelligent and lively participation. I hope we'll see you again soon. I hope on February 23rd. In the meantime, let me close things out now. Uh, we have a question here. Wait, how do we get to the evaluations? You go to the uh, seminar webpage, the webpage from which you obtained your readings for the seminar, and you'll see a button there that says evaluations. Click on that form will pop up. You can fill it out online and shoot it back to us. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your seminar participation this evening. Hope you'll all sign up for another one. Remember, our next one is February 23rd. Thank you very much and good evening.